Welcome to the October Zindi Weekends. This is our second to last one. So um, we are very excited to be working with Wadwani AI from India. I have with me Jerome White. Uh, Jerome is the Senior Machine Learning Scientist at Wadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, Jerome has been working on collecting this data set for quite a while, you can probably elaborate on how long you've <laughs> been collecting the data set for and the impact this data set and problem will have. Um, so over to you, Jerome. Thanks, thanks so much here, I'll, um, and welcome everyone. I hear there's a recent graduate in the room, so big congratulations there. Um, yeah, so here's a, a slide presentation I'd like to go through. I'll take about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and as Amy mentioned, thank you so much. I am a member of the Wadwani AI uh, machine learning team. And uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes just introducing the organization. We're relatively new. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit more toward the end um, about the, the competition that we're running and why the help, why help from the, the Zindi community is, is so important and why we're so excited to be working with, with everyone. So, uh, Wadwani AI is a nonprofit dedicated to making positive social impact. We do so by developing and deploying AI based uh, solutions. Our focus is on underserved communities, particularly in India, but I think a lot of the challenges that we deal with are common uh, throughout the developing, the developing world. So the, the name Wadwani is actually comes from a family who uh, has a strong track record of philanthropic uh, efforts throughout India. And uh, the leaders of that effort are the two, our two brothers, uh, Ramesh and Sunil Badwani. They are on the far left and the far right in this photo. And in 2018, they, they kind of had this idea, this insight that AI is being used for good throughout the world, but the focus really kind of is on the global north or relatively wealthy segments of society where uh, you know, there's a lot of financial incentive to do so. And so what they thought was, hey, let's try and open an organization that's focused on uh, uh, underserved communities where AI may be missed if for-profit institutes are the only ones that are going to do this. So we were inaugurated in 2018. And again, do you see the, the two brothers on the far left and the far right? But in the center is a gentleman that I don't think needs any introduction at the time. Uh, and still present today, he is our prime minister. So our inauguration, he decided to make time to come down because he was so excited about the effort to help us open open the Institute up. So we have a lot of interest uh, and a lot of support from various levels um, uh, within the country. So you can think of Wadwani really as this kind of container organization for a number of different um, solutions that we, uh, again, deploy primarily throughout India. But we have um, several different, this slide is, you know, I, there's probably a lot more projects that we actually have internally, but this slide is, note some of the, the ones that are in more mature stages of deployment and, and development. So we have an agriculture arm, and that's the one I'll, I'll get into uh, shortly. We also do uh, a number of different projects within the health space, so maternal and child health, as well as uh, tuberculosis. So again, when you think of Wadwani, think of a number of different solutions that try to tackle these problems that are just really important, not only to society, but in particular um, underserved uh, sort of portions of society. So uh, I'll pick a few of these. One is, is loss to follow-up, and this is within our tuberculosis um, catalog. Um, and so the, the idea or the, the challenge is that uh, there's a kind of a tuberculosis cascade. So these individual, the red individuals there at the top are the new active cases, and there's about two or three million, um, I think, active, it's 2018, but there's about two or three million. And then the what we'd like to get them is to the bottom of this pyramid where the treatment is complete and they have positive health outcomes. But uh, tuberculosis treatment is long and it's arduous and many people kind of drop off somewhere between the top and the bottom and they think there's about a half a million that go missing. So what we have is a machine learning um, solution that has been tested and developed on almost a million patient records that uh, can predict or does a good job of predicting who may get lost during this follow-up and during this care journey. Uh, and this is particularly helpful for, um, you know, doctors or hospitals to try and focus their efforts on patients who may be at risk of, of 
of leaving. The other um, solution within tuberculosis is uh, cough against TB. So we recognize, that, again, there's this big problem of lots of TB cases, but then a lot go missing because uh, triaging and screening are limited, inaccessible, and expensive for some of the remote or public hospitals. So uh, we recognize that cough sounds can be used as indicators of whether you have TB. So we've built uh, deep learning models that look at the cough sound, we convert it to a spectrogram, then use ResNet to, to featureize it, as well as um, medical record data that's more tabular that also uh, predicts uh, TB or not. We ensemble those two, and then we come up with an ultimate prediction. So this work is ongoing. We're excited about it. And it was actually based on <clears throat> work we did or developed during COVID when we were helping our local government um, at trying to assess that risk where you cough, basically cough sounds can be a determinant of COVID, and we quickly were able to, to uh, change that project into one that's now addressing TB. The final one I'll, I'll kind of look at is uh, maternal and child health. So this is, this is a project that we've been working on since really since our inception, uh, and it's, it's gotten quite a bit of attention. The, the challenge is that um, children face the highest risk of death in their first month of life, particularly children who are born maybe in public hospitals or born in areas where the healthcare system isn't quite as strong as it is in maybe big cities or, or private hospitals or, or for the wealth, wealthy individuals. And one of the risks comes from low birth weight. So if, if you can assess low birth weight early, uh, you can really get kids on the right track for you know, the rest of their lives. Uh, not just prevent death, but, but really make them healthy individuals uh, as they grow. The, the challenge is that to do this manually requires that ASHAs and frontline workers carry weighing devices to the different um, newborn homes that they have to go to uh, during their daily visits. And these devices are <clears throat> kind of heavy. They have to remember them. Sometimes they need calibration. And so and not just that, once they identify, then they have to you know, go through a, a path of, of letting everyone know uh, that this child needs some help and some attention. So we've developed uh, a smartphone app that under the, under the hood uses a deep learning uh, model to go basically from video. So on the left there, you see a video that's, uh, or frames from a video of a newborn. And you know, we've, we've uh, put dots over that for anonymization, but uh, they take videos of newborns. We featureize the frames of those um, videos. We uh, then combine the features in a way that allows us to uh, use regression to estimate weight. So uh, again, this is an example of a, a deep learning model that, that we've designed and tested um, and are trying to deploy. Uh, before I talk about ag, I do want to take a step back because a lot of people, when they think of AI for good, they really just focus on that bubble there on the right, ML, AI, and research, and, and using cool models. But to, to really have impact requires a, a much bigger, that's only a small slice of the pie. And, and the way our organization is structured, uh, we have uh, the, I, what I think of as the remaining components of that pie. So we have uh, a monitoring evaluation team who is specialized in trying to measure the impact we have. We have an engineering team who's very good at getting these models on, on mobile phones and developing apps that people can use or collect data. We have user research and design who specialize in you know, understanding how people can consume this in optimal ways. And then we have domain expertise. These are like doctors, entomologists, uh, agri experts who are uh, really able to uh, get on the ground, understand uh, what problems people face and, and really help design solutions. And then what's not here is, you know, we have uh, support admin infra um, operations that are all devoted to, to really our organization's mission. So I think this, is, this slide is quite important to me because I think it's the key as to why we can do the work we do um, that a lot of people don't quite realize. And then finally, um, we uh, don't do this alone. We have lots of partners. On this slide, we are looking at some of the government partners that we work with, both at the national and the state level. Uh, but we also have universities that we work with, different collaborations that aren't listed here. And then uh, now we have our uh, Zindi. I can count Zindi as one of our partners for opening up a community and helping us to just really solve these problems. So with that, um, we'll get into the 
if you recall a few slides ago, we had those three tiers and I didn't talk about agriculture, but I think now is the time because we can talk a bit more about what this hackathon uh, is trying to do as well as uh, what we're trying to achieve from the, the competition. So what, what we've addressed with this particular uh, solution is an early warning system uh, for pest advisory. So helping smallholder cotton farmers or cotton farmers across India rather make better pest management decisions. And as a motivation, so cotton is important, particularly for India. 26, uh, we grow 26% of the world's cotton by some estimates, that's more than uh, any other country. 41% uh, of our farmland is devoted to it. That's the largest area into cultivation of any country. We have about 6 million cotton farmers and an additional 40 to 50 uh, that are kind of within the industry, people like ginners or, or farm labor that are involved in this, but maybe aren't you know, planting seeds. So this is a pretty big community. What's also important is in that 6 million, a lot of them are smallholder farmers. So uh, this particular group, um, you know, for them, they don't have a lot of land holdings. So cotton represents a significant portion of their earnings. And, uh, it, it, you know, getting, getting it right is very, very important to them. Unfortunately, cotton farming is not easy. So a lot of the crop is lost due to uh, pest attacks. There's all sorts of pests that live on these cotton farms and, and they really can do damage to the crop. One of the more pernicious pests are known as ballworms, and that's what our solution and this competition is trying uh, to address. So ballworms, as a little background on the right, there's a couple images. Most people, when they think of cotton, they think of that top image, this very white, fluffy uh, cloud of, of cotton across the field that's ready to be plucked and, and used. But when you have a ballworm problem, what opens up is not the fluffy white, it's what's on the bottom. And that is a cotton ball that is, uh, you know, kind of gross, but more importantly, unusable. So a farmer who thinks they may have a nice field will find out that, well, none of this is usable because a ballworm has infected a lot of the balls throughout their field. So one way to address this um, is through pesticide. And 50% of India's total pesticide usage is on cotton. And it's not just for ballworms. Like I said, there's a number of pests that, uh, that attack cotton, but pesticide usage is one kind of nuclear option for addressing this. Um, pesticides, not only are they toxic, but they're expensive. And so for smallholder farmers, that decision to spray can be significant uh, because it's gonna eat into the, the profit that they end up making. So um, what we'd like is to help them be smarter about that um, and do things appropriately. So our solution, uh, again, is, is a mobile app that helps them make um, better decisions around, around pesticide usage uh, pertaining to, uh, to ballworms. So how does it work? So um, what happens, and this isn't, uh, so even, even before we kind of our Wadwani solution came into the picture, there was an effort that asked for farmers to begin using um, pheromone traps to both catch these pests, but also to give an indication of how much damage is being done. And so the pheromone trap works as follows. It's essentially a, uh, this trap that you can mount to a pole and you can mount it to a common stick, that's easy enough. And it has um, uh, a pheromone in the top. So that red circle, I don't know if it's difficult to see, but that red circle is the lid and from uh, coming down from that lid is a, is a pheromone and uh, underneath is, is a bag. So the pheromone attracts male ballworms that are fully grown and they try and fly at that, you know, the pheromone, they're attracted to it and they get stuck in the bag. Um, and what happens is that the, at the very bottom of that bag, there's just sort of a rubber band and you can now go throughout your field uh, regularly every few days or once a week, open the bag and, and see how many males got trapped. And that is a proxy for the reproductive activity that's happened in your field. So if you see a lot of males, there's probably a lot of eggs that have been laid uh, in your field and you need to take action before, before they grow and they infect your balls like we saw on the, on the, on the previous side, slide, the, the cotton balls. Um, the way this was done before we came along was quite manual. So uh, they would empty the farmers or extension workers would empty the trap um, it required that they be able to recognize what a ballworm is uh, and know the association between counts and what action should be taken. 
Um, and sometimes that effort wasn't instantaneous. There, there was some consultation that needed to happen at offices and it would take quite a while for them to get an answer on what they should do. So um, our solution comes along and it asks them to empty the trap onto a white sheet of paper. So that's what the individual is doing on the left. And once he empties it, he can use our app to take a photo of the pests. And uh, in step number three, it's not shown, but we have an object detection work, uh, network that lives on the app. So it's, it's offline. It, it recognizes the pest, counts the pest, and using that count uh, provides the app provides um, a recommendation on what to do. And that recommendation, there are the association between counts and, and what to do uh, comes from our experts and consultation with some of the partner organizations that I mentioned before. The AI ML part, the magic is actually recognizing and counting pests in a number of different um, you know, uh, mobile phone images. So in some cases, in this case, uh, this particular user has been asked to, um, to spray. This number of pests means that they should actually take action. But if there's something less, we can tell them to do something less toxic, like uh, use um, an organic solution or maybe not do anything at all. Don't be worried. Uh, you're fine. So um, that is what the solution is designed to do. And the longer term competition that we started last week, and I think ends in December, ask competitors to help us get better at counting, although we've developed a model that, that does it, uh, you know, the crowd is often better than a few individuals. So please do participate in that. It will definitely help us make better recommendations for the farmers. Um, and that, that deals with counting. What we're doing for the hackathon is something slightly different though. So the previous slide, this is how farmers use the app, but this is also how farmers use the app. So instead of taking photos of pests on a white sheet of paper, photos are taken of these random things. So in, in, in that center-ish photo of a bag, that might be a user who didn't quite understand the, the photographic uh, instructions. And so they didn't know a white sheet of paper was used. They just took a photo of the bag. Fair enough. That's, you know, that's uh, a usage thing. The other photos are often people who have just gotten the app and are playing with it. I mean, all of us do this, right? You get an app, you just want to get a feel for it, play with the flow, and you take random things that maybe the app designers didn't have in mind. That's fine. The problem is when our app actually looks at these photos and makes a a pest decision. So imagine, you know, you're a farmer, uh, you've taken a photo of your motorbike here on the right, and we actually tell you to spray that motorbike. Um, it's, it's not good. Uh, because for them, again, you're asking them, to, we're asking them to use this app on something that is critical to their livelihoods. So if we can't get it right on a motorbike, what trust do they have in us to get it right in the field? And this, this really hurts us because what this means is not only do they not come back and use the app, but sometimes they'll tell their community that, hey, yeah, that app is kind of silly. They're still testing it. You know, it told me to, to, to use my bike. And so, you know, getting retention is really difficult. So what we really like to do, what we need to get better at, what we're asking the Zindi community to help us with are recognize such images and classify them appropriately so that our app can make a better um, determination. So in this case, we're not giving them uh, instructions to spray. We'll tell them, listen, we don't see any pests here. Uh, please you know, use this in, in, in a different way, right? Spread them on a white sheet of paper, make sure you're in your field. And I, I really think, so some of our designers are behind this. Like I said, we have a design team, they're behind this and have said that this can really uh, increase the trust that they have in the app and help them come back. So um, yeah, it'll help us in doing that. So, so to sort of finish uh, our goal, we have a big, big goal that in the next couple of years, we'd like to, to reach at least a million of these smallholder cotton farmers with this app. And the only way we're going to do that is by improving reliability um, to drive that type of scale. So this is difficult to do on our own. We've got a number of challenges, uh, both counting and, and um, image recognition. And we feel that we have a much better chance of achieving this, this goal with the help of, of the Zindi community. So um, that's it. Thanks so much, Amy. And I'm looking forward to working with everybody and seeing what, uh, what we come up with. Awesome, thank you, Jerome. I've got a couple of questions for you, yes. um, but I'm going to stay quiet for a minute okay. or two. Okay. If anyone else has a question, please unmute yourself or post it in the chat.
um, while we're waiting. Could you tell us the difference between a pink bollworm and an American bollworm? I see in the uh, first challenge that there is a difference. There is a difference. So I don't have any, that's a good question. I don't have any images of pink bollworms. So uh, I guess for, for others that may not be familiar, there are various types of ballworms. The two that we address are called uh, pink ballworms and American ballworms. Pink ballworms um, are generally smaller. So I, yes, this is a photo of pink ballworms. They're generally smaller. They're shaped more like this. Uh, these look like mini rugby balls, I guess. Um, the American ballworm, I unfortunately don't have any, it's a great question. I don't have any images on hand, but usually they're, they're much bigger. So maybe an American ballworm would be the size of say two of these. Um, they often tend to have their wings intact as well. So when these, when the pink ballworm gets trapped, uh, you know, its wings kind of fold up and sometimes they fall off, but the American ballworm seems to be a bit more uh, robust to this kind of thing. So sometimes you'll get more wing. But really, it's it's the, the difference is sometimes they're just much bigger. Uh, yeah, I hope that answered. Without photos, it's it's tough, but I think that's the yeah. And is this where your app comes in that you have different interventions for the pink and American? That's right. So um, the object, uh, the the networks that we have are trained. Uh, so any anyone else on this call who has has looked at object detection, you can think of this as just different labels. So we have labels. We ask annotators to make labels. Uh, for peep, for pink ballworms, so they would label this pink ballworm, and then and then other images they would label it American ballworms, and then we train the object detection network to kind of distinguish between the two, um, and the the count that ends up coming out does yes, there are different instructions for what to do in a pink ballworm case versus what to do in, in an American ballworm case, um, and it's not just about the type of ballworm. It often uh, has to do with um, uh, where, uh, you know, where a farmer might be within the, the season, the date from sowing. Um, sometimes it depends on where they are in the country. There are certain protocols that I guess work better, say, in North India than they do in maybe the east or the south. Um, but again, th those type of rules, we rely on our, on our programs team to, uh, to figure out based on their interactions with these different uh, extension programs. Wow, that's awesome. Um, when I know as data scientists, we just focus so, like just on our part. Um, and it's amazing that you get to work with policy and like environmental concerns. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, so again, if this were just, you know, I think a, a very focused machine learner researcher would take this problem and say, look, you know, I'll, um, we can, we can build a ballworm solution, uh, but in order to have impact, it's really this end-to-end -end thing of, of getting people to follow a protocol, being good at recognition, as well as, as being able to provide um, insight that's effective. So, um, We've got a question here from Ram. Thank you for the presentation. Should the model be able to identify a particular ballworm or just the ballworm is fine? Um, so I'm going to answer this question. So for okay. the weekend question, this weekend three-day mini hackathon, this is just a binary image classification. So has the farmer taken a test image or a silly image such as these? Um, and you'll need to indicate that with a zero. Or is um, the image such as image number two that we can use to do our counting on? The bigger challenge for 15,000 euros, which is our largest prize pot on Zindi ever, uh, which is quite exciting. This is a more complicated problem. You need to do the binary detection to throw out the images that are negative, so such as images of the bike. And then you will need to count the numbers of American and numbers of pink. Um, Jerome, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, that, that nailed it. Um, cool. That's right. So, so yeah, if you're successful in this hackathon, you can use, you know, you could potentially use that solution as a, a stepping stone or a foundation on which to uh, build a model for the for the bigger the bigger challenge. Ram, I hope that's answered your question. 
I am going to walk through the challenge now and okay. I'm I've got a mini really starter notebook. If anyone has any more questions, please do post them in the comment or unmute yourself to ask. And I haven't introduced myself. My name is Amy. My username is Amy Florida 66. I'm the competitions lead at Cindy. Uh, so I'm the one that's normally on the discussion board and setting up these challenges with my team. So this is the competition we're working on this weekend. It's the Wadwani AI Bullworm Classification Challenge. The trick is in the word classification. We, the second challenge is the counting challenge. Um, once the competition is finished, we will add this link in the webinar section so that you can rewatch it if you've got any questions um, or if you want to revisit what Jerome has spoke about. Um, we've got a description of what the challenge is, which you can read in depth, um, a bit about Wadawani and about their sponsors, which is the Fair Forward and GIZ organization, which is doing amazing work in India and Africa. The evaluation for this challenge is area under the curve. The closer your overall score is to one is better. So you are trying to maximize your predictions. Prizes, $150 for the first place, $90 for the second, and $60 for the final place. And there are 500 points available. So if you don't make it into the top three, you still do get an award. This competition closes on Sunday at midnight GMT, um, which is 3 a.m. Kenyan time. So <laughs> enjoy. Teams, you are allowed to work either as an individual or a team up to four. A reminder to please not share information outside of a team. And you can make 50 submissions per day and 150 submissions for the over the three days. Um, when the competition ends, you need to select two of your best submissions. In the data, uh, Jerome, here I've got a picture. So this would be a negative image or an image of a bike or the farm. And over here is a positive image. So this is indicated as a one. And here are the six pink ballworms, which I'm assuming are these smaller ones. And then the six American ballworms, which are the bigger. And you can see some of their wings. The files are available for download. I will upload the starter notebook in a moment. We have the sample submission. This shows you what your file needs to look like. The orders does not matter, but the ID needs to be correct. The test images, this are just the IDs that you need to use. Train has the IDs as well as the label. If it's a one or a zero, um, a useful image or a negative image. And then our images file. Our images are six gigabytes. Um, which is quite a hefty download, but as soon as it's in your Google Drive, it's a lot easier to work with. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please use the discussion board. Um, one of the best parts about working at Cindy is I've already seen the data, which means that I was the first on the leaderboard. It's the only time I'm ever allowed to be first. I will be removing myself from the competition at the end. Um, but yes. Uh, over here, you can create a team, and over here, you'll see your submissions. Um, so here we have a starter notebook. It has just finished running. This is a very quick starter notebook. I want to highlight that I have not set the seed. Setting the seed means no matter what, my predictions are always the same. This is really important to do um, for reproducibility and to make sure that you stay at the top of the leaderboard. So I uh, mount my drive. I'm using Google Colab. I have upgraded and installed Fast AI. There are many different libraries on different approaches that you can take. I personally prefer Fast AI. I will be doing the code review for this. So you do not have to use the starter notebook. You can completely scrap it and choose a different take. 
here I'm making the directory images. I'm copying the file from my drive just to content so it's easier to work with. I'm unzipping the files. This whole process, um, installing, copying, takes about seven minutes. Uh, so don't be scared that it's not working or anything. Um, I have over here, I've installed FOST AI. Now I'm just making sure that I import all the libraries, imported pandas, I've imported um, image, and I've imported PyPlot. Although I can actually remove PyPlot as I don't use it um, as code, a code reviewer. This is one of my pet peeves, having libraries that are not necessary in your imports. Um, so over here, we're just gonna view the train set. As you can see, each image has got ID underscore, and we have the labels zero or one. Zero indicates that it's a throwaway image, um, such as the motorbike or something that's not a pure white piece of paper that has bullworms on it. If we look at the distribution, most images are correct and have a bullworm in it, and a few aren't. Over here, we, um, I'm just showing a couple of the images. This would be categorized as a one, this is a zero. Zero, even though it's a white piece of paper, it's got no ballworms on it, so it's a zero. This looks like it has ballworms, but um, the Afrikaans word, as I'm from South Africa, is the word mechi. Um, so I wanted to say the word mechis here are squished. I'm just using a very basic CNN learner. This on my Google Colab took about 20 minutes to run. Um, so you can run it in the same time. It's, please note that I have not done any augmentations. If you'd like to improve your model, you can flip the images, change colors, rotate them, invert them, and see how that improves your accuracy. Um, I have fine-tuned my model and again took about 15 minutes to run and now we get to make our predictions as I said a super simple notebook but something to get you going we're going to import our test set import our sample submission our sample submission shows us what needs to be submitted um, here we get our predictions using um, our learner that we train. And here we set our probabilities. I don't know why the sun is still running. It should have finished. And over here, I'm setting my test file or my sample submission file to false, uh, to the predictions. Just a reminder to set your index to false. Uh, this is important as the Zindi platform does not score any files, it still has the index. So if you have an error, first check to make sure that your index is set to false, and then second check that you've got all the submission IDs. Once you have your submission, you can click on submit, choose a file, and you can make your submission. And this will put you on the leaderboard. Does anyone have any questions? Um, yes, you can use Colab. The, if you look on our learn page, there's a sneaky article on how to import um, files straight from Zindi to Colab. Um, but maybe the easiest would be to download, but there are some ways around that. Um, so this is the official end of the webinar. I am going to stop recording. So there's no pressure that you're being recorded and asking questions. And Jerome and I are going to be here for the next five or so minutes. If you'd like, you can drop off um, and hopefully see you on the leaderboard.